You may have saved that video to your favorites playlist, but can you really be certain that it's still there? The following audio recordings were done by me for other channels, but if you were to try to look for those videos now, they would be impossible to find. I'm going to share these recordings with you now. Welcome to Volume 2 of something I call The Lost Recordings. I'm Fearcrawler. Let's dive down this rabbit hole together. Mike is lazily jogging on the leaf-covered dirt road that runs through the forest near his house. Why am I doing this? I could have been snoozing under my warm blanket all cozy and stuff, he thinks, stopping to catch his breath. Running can't be healthy. Can't be? Uh, I'm sweating, my body is aching, I feel like I'm going to throw up. There's nothing healthy about that. At the turn of the path, he spots another jogger. Groaning, Mike straightens up and starts to sluggishly jog again. Getting closer, he can see that the other jogger is a woman, her chestnut hair tied into a ponytail and her breasts bobbing up and down hypnotically. The two joggers pass each other. Mike turns his neck awkwardly around to get a better look at the woman's behind. Damn, he mumbles, a bit louder than he would have liked. The woman turns around and the two joggers lock eyes. Mike loses his balance and stumbles forward. He lowers his head and sprints away as quickly as his fat legs allow him. Shit. After spending the past months pitying his fat blob of a body, he finally made the decision to start exercising. Instead of spending his hard-earned money to get a subscription at his local gym, he decided to start jogging in the forest near his house. As a matter of fact, Lots of people used to go to the forest to exercise. Even a nice, curling pathway that runs through the whole forest was paved to help joggers find their way through the densely wooded area. Inexplicably, people gradually stopped going there. All the better for Mike, who can now jog in peace. Mike leans against a tree to catch his breath. That little sprint really got to him. He takes a good look at the forest around him. The tall trees provide nice, thick shading and the birds chirp lovely, cheerful tunes. His vision gets lost in a sea of brown and red leaves. He breathes in the earthy smells of the forest. The tranquility of the woods calms his nerves and soothes his spirit. Mike, for the first time in his life, feels connected to the natural world around him. His heartbeat synchronizes with the rhythm of the forest, and his breath joins the sounds of nature in the timeless chorus of life. Then, a feeling of unease creeps into Mike's heart, breaking the serenity of the moment. A shiver runs down his spine and the hair on the back of his neck stands up. He finds himself staring deep into the forest. The world around him feels like a dream. He has no control over his body as his legs carry him towards the center of the forest. Drunkenly, he looks around. Time seems to have stopped and an eerie stillness hangs in the air as he walks past trees and bushes. A crunching sound brings Mike back to his senses. He looks at his feet. He has stepped on a twig, snapping it in half. Weird, he mutters. Confused, he walks back to the paved path. Silence has fallen over the woods, and he can't shake off the feeling that something sinister lurks in the bowels of the forest. After a few minutes of uneventful jogging, he sees something out of place in the distance. He squints, but he can't make out much. When he gets close enough to the weird object, he realizes that it is simply a chair. A chair out in the woods. Mike can't help but feel a bit weirded out by a chair abandoned in a forest. It seems... off. Next morning finds Mike once again jogging across the muddy track. God, my body hurts so badly. The sky is painted a dull gray, with dark clouds hovering ominously low above the ground. The air is chilly and humid, with a slight breeze picking up every once in a while. Mike had to put on a heavy hoodie to fend off the cold. 
He had been jogging for about half an hour. When he reaches the spot, he saw the chair. It is now gone. Only four dry patches of grass where the chair's legs previously stood are visible. Hmm. Someone must have moved it then. Mike thinks and keeps jogging. A sudden gust of wind blows the leaves on Mike's right and carries them across the path. Following the leaves' trajectory with his eyes, Mike spots a vaguely human-shaped shadow moving in the distance. Distracted, he slips on the damp leaves scattered on the path. When he regains his balance, the shadow is nowhere to be seen. Mike holds his breath and listens. Nothing. Uh, Just my overactive imagination, he thinks and resumes jogging, casting a quick look over his shoulder just to be safe. He is now walking near the center of the forest in a densely wooded area, covering what little of the sunlight escapes the wall of clouds, and casting thick shading over the damp ground. It is so dark that Mike has to look at his watch to confirm it is still morning. The forest itself feels asleep. Nothing moves and no sound is made. Only Mike's heavy breathing, and the rhythmic sound of his soles hitting the leaf-covered ground. He looks left and right at the scenery, enthralled, and a little unsettled by the earthly stillness of the forest. Through the wall of trees and branches, Mike spots the sun's rays penetrating the forest's armor and reaching the ground in a beam of blinding light. In a heartbeat, he decides he wants to look at this marvel from up close, so he carefully starts making his way towards the light. Stepping over a fallen log, he scrapes his shin on its rough bark. Ah, shit! He mumbles under his breath as he carries on. Mike looks up. There is no light beam. Confused, he quickly steps forward and takes a good look around. Where he thought he saw the light, he now sees a small muddy pond. He looks up at the thick mass of foliage and branches. There's no way light can pass through that, he realizes. Maybe my mind is playing tricks on me. His attention shifts back on the murky pond, where foamy bubbles start appearing on its surface. Curious, Mike leans forward, but a putrid smell hits his nostrils and he is immediately forced back. Moments later, he can only watch in terror as a large shape starts emerging from the depths of the dark waters. For a split second, Mike spots broad shoulders and an arched back. Adrenaline kicking in, he starts running back towards the path. A few seconds of desperate running later and the familiar path is nowhere to be seen. Mike looks around in panic. He doesn't recognize any of his surroundings. In his attempt to escape, he gets lost. He tries to come up with something, anything but his mind is frozen. Then, he hears shuffling of leaves and branches all around him. The rotten odor from the pond hangs in the air once again. Suddenly, a bulky figure steps out of the cover of tall bushes and tree trunks. Heart beating fast in his chest, Mike starts running once more. Twigs and branches claw at his face, but he doesn't stop until he is confident that he has put a lot of distance between himself and his pursuer, or pursuers. Out of breath, he heaves his weight against a tree for support. With the corner of his eyes, he spots a woodcutter's axe buried in a tree on his right. Without giving it much thought, he lunges towards it. Just as he is extending his hand to grab the axe, he hears heavy footsteps approaching. Mike is petrified. The leaves to his left start parting. A large hand reaches out, pushing branches to the side. Mike lets out a cry of fear and starts running blindly forward. Moments later, he reaches a clearing in the woods. He runs towards the center of the small meadow, eyes peering at him from behind the tree line. He is surrounded. Exhausted and terrified, A feeling of lightheadedness wafts over him. He takes a step back, trying to steady himself. A circle of chairs lays at the corner of the clearing. 
They are all positioned facing inward. The sight unnerves him. What the fuck is going on? He thinks, his heart beating frantically in his chest. Before he can react, something hard hits him on the back of his head, and he falls unconscious on the ground. His eyes open. The moonlight is shining bright on his face. He is sitting on a chair. He tries to move, but his limbs don't obey. The wind is blowing softly through leaves and branches, which whistle a sepulchral tune under the breeze's gentle touch. Mike realizes he is still in the grassy clearing. He hears footsteps behind him. Panic grips his mind. The footsteps get closer. Now he can hear heavy breathing just behind his back. In a frenzy, he looks around, desperately trying to find anything to help him escape. His gaze shifts to the corner of the clearing. The circle of chairs is still there. This time, they're not empty. Sitting on them are men and women in hoodies and sweatpants and athletic gear. Mike can only watch in horror as he realizes their heads have been severed only to be replaced by small wooden logs. Suddenly, they all start turning their heads towards him, their facial features crudely carved on the hard wood. He tries to scream, but nothing comes out. Then, a decaying odor fills the air. Everything goes silent, like the earth itself is holding its breath. A man with broad shoulders and wide torso steps in front of Mike. His head is missing. A fungi-infested wound stands bare at the end of his neck, and mud is dripping down his body. His strong arms hold an axe, which he slowly raises above his head. The last sight on Mike's eyes is the axe, chopping his head off. <laughs> to start off, let me explain what astral projection is. Astral projection is a willful out of body experience, it is the projection of your astral body a consciousness separate from our physical body, capable of traveling throughout the universe. It may seem far-fetched, but it's anything but far-fetched. Inside of this astral realm, you can do practically anything. You can fly through miles of fluffy clouds, or you can float through galaxies in the universe. The possibilities are endless. But what I was never warned about were the creatures I may encounter. For years, I only encountered beings of light. Beings of light are the entities that seek to help humanity. I've met angels. I've met astral dragons. I've met friends that have died. I thought I had seen it all in the astral realm, but I was wrong. I was so shaken up by the events of that one night, I've been too scared to talk about it, in fear that he was watching. I feel him watching me at this very moment. I've been astral projecting for years. My spiritual journey began when I was quite young. I was only 12 when I discovered that I could lucid dream. I didn't learn that I was actually lucid dreaming until later on, but at that time, it was the coolest thing. I went to sleep every night, excited to see what adventures my dreams had in store for me. God. How I wish I could go back to the times when I hadn't gone further than lucid dreaming. Perhaps then, I wouldn't be plagued with this fear. I started astral projecting when I was 16 or 17, and my spirituality only grew from there. I'm not an expert on all things spiritual, but I've had quite some experience. The other night, I was having trouble leaving my physical body which is unusual, considering I usually leave after 20 to 40 minutes. 
I believe this was a sign from the universe, urging me not to do it tonight. But you may take from this information what you will. After struggling for an hour and a half, I finally projected myself. I felt the familiar vibrations tingle around my body, and I heard the pop, signaling that I was out. I knew what I wanted to do. A friend had told me about her own astral journey, and how she flew through space for hours, visiting different galaxies and planets. I've astrally traveled to space before, but only floated above Earth for a little while before coming back to my physical body. Extreme emotions like excitement can make you wake up, returning to your physical body. Before I could even fly out, I found myself staring into a black sky. I looked around and saw that I was in a desert. Light from an unknown source casted a dim glow over the rocky desert. I couldn't see any buildings or structures or anything at all really. The only thing I could see was a circle of light in the distance, about a mile away. Everything in my head was telling me not to go near it. My brain was screaming for me to wake up, but the curiosity had blinded me. I flew towards it, cautiously. Less than 50 feet away, I noticed something. Next to the bright light was someone. This was a creature I had never seen before. He looked human, but the black feathery wings spread behind him said otherwise. The wings were enormous. One bat of his wings looked like he could blow me away. Silky black hair fell on his shoulders, framing his skinny pale face. Sharp black horns grew out of his head. He wore a simple black robe, contrasting against his pale skin. His skin. Oh, his skin. It looked almost translucent, but not quite. As I approached him, the light next to him dimmed until it was completely gone. He didn't say anything. He only looked deeply into my eyes. As he looked into my eyes, he showed me the future. He showed me death, pain, the torture of millions of people. When I couldn't take it any longer, I looked away from him, squeezing my eyes shut. Without speaking, he told me something, something that has been haunting me. Your God has abandoned you. There is no one left to save you all. After realizing what he had said, I looked up at him in horror. Amused by my fear, a sick smile spread across his face. Suddenly I was right in front of him, refusing to look into his eyes. His cold hand grabbed my chin, digging his nails into my skin as he forced me to look at him. He showed me the emptiness that follows death, the lost souls wandering around with nowhere to go. There was no hell, but there was also no heaven. An eternity of wandering is something that is worse than anything from hell. We are the life created by God himself, but we are the life of destruction. Letting go of me, he told me one last thing. You may wander for eternity, or you may join me in the torment of these lost souls. Which will you choose? The same bright light he appeared with came, blinding me momentarily. As the light dimmed, I realized he was gone. And then, I was awake. I returned to my physical body and sat up in bed. Was that a demon? Was he telling the truth? My head spun with questions. I crept out of my bed and looked in the mirror. On my chin were three red marks. A shiver went up my spine as I touched them. I crawled back into bed, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. It's been three weeks since that night, and ever since then, he has been following me everywhere I go. I see him in the reflection of every mirror, every glass. 
I see him in the corner of my eye. I feel his black eyes burning into the back of my head. He's waiting. I have to make my decision. Tonight, I will astral project for the last time, and I may not come back. Wish me luck. I should probably preface this with a simple characteristic about myself, seeing as how it will be the reason I make this entire entry in the first place. I see spirits. Not only spirits, but fairies, angels, guides, and pretty much anything you can think of. With that being said, yes, I can see demons. <laughs> Beat you to the punch there, didn't I? That's the one thing everyone asks as soon as I drop the I can see ghost bomb. Most of the time I just tell people that demons aren't real, that I can't see them. I only say this because much of the normal populace would not take the idea of demons walking around lightly. How would you feel if I had told you that, on an average day, I see at least five lower level demons trailing behind the humans they latched onto? You'd feel like shit, let's be real. Because unless you're someone like me, you would never know if something was following you, tormenting you, making your life a living hell. Your life would be a constant panic attack, wondering if you'll wake up with claw marks or even worse, a pentagram etched into your living room table. Yes, I've seen that. Higher level demons are a force to be reckoned with, that's for sure. But enough about the gift I have. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. The point of this entry is to keep people cautious, to make sure people don't go around messing with things that could fuck with their lives or send them straight to hell. The way I see it, if I tell you all some situations I've been in, maybe that'll make you a little more cautious the next time you pick up a Ouija board. For the first memory I'll tell you all, We'll start off with something tame, an earthbound spirit to be exact. Now, these spirits are usually harmless aside from the emotional drain from time to time. I've experienced a lot of these guys and, most of the time, the only energy they let off is one of either confusion or content. Many choose this or are fresh after death as I like to call it. They don't exactly know what they're doing and are trying to find their way around in the spirit realm, which is a lot more tricky to navigate than you think. These spirits will present themselves as human, or some contorted version of human. Seeing as how they were human in our realm, it would only make sense for them to look it in the afterlife. There are, however, some cases where I've come across earthbound spirits that are only a dark silhouette like that of a shadow. Those guys might be a little harrowing to see at first, but they're just roaming around trying to get their bearings. Like I said, not harmful except for the occasional emotional sapping. That just means they're noticing the things you're feeling and are interested in it, so they're tapping into your emotions to try and feel them as well. A simple guard will stop this if you find yourself feeling drained. Now that that's out of the way, we're on to fairies. Now these little balls of light are quite something, I've got to say. A lot of people describe them as little people with wings. Some people like to say they look terrifying and cause mischief, I, on the other hand, see these beings as small orbs or sparks of light. They tend to bounce around quickly and dart all over property. The reason for this is because fairies are protectors of land, like small bodyguards watching over the trees, flowers, things like that. If you live in a condo, townhome, or apartment, well, never fear. You still have small little bodyguards that will bounce from area to area around the complex you live in, making sure everything is safe and protected. The only catch is that you need to take care of the land you're on. That is, you shouldn't go around chopping down every tree you have or ripping up the earth at your feet. I've known a few friends who had completely devastated their properties, building dirt bike roads, outdoor pools, setting an old tree on fire to burn the damn thing down and get it out of the way of their million dollar view. They got their million dollar view, but had to sacrifice a car in order to do so. The reason I say that is because the week after they had done so, a particularly nasty storm had uprooted a large oak tree that they had chosen to keep for an aesthetic purpose, landed smack dab on their brand new Corvette. <laughs> Ain't that a shame? Next on the list is angels. 
The first time I saw an angel, I was floored. They're monstrous in size, towering over us and reaching the height of buildings a few stories high. They're donned in full armor, shimmering armor that's unique only to them. They are, as you could probably assume, filled with good energy and light. When I say filled with light, I mean they emanate it. Coming close to an angel can cause brief periods of dizziness, as well as a rush of euphoria from the pure energy they radiate. Other than those things, they're a complete mystery. I know they protect people and are steadfast against malevolent beings, but other than that, I'm in the dark. I just know that I can't help but smile every time I see one, knowing they're here to help us and keep us safe as much as they can. On to our next subject, spirit guides. These are beings that remain with you throughout your entire life, trying to steer you towards your life's purpose, whatever that may be. Your life's purpose might be to become a doctor for that one patient that will end world hunger, or it could be you becoming a heroin addict so that you can learn a valuable lesson in this life, and be ready for the next life with more enlightenment from the hardship you endured. Whatever it may be, they're by your side through thick and thin. They can look odd as well. I've seen guides that project themselves as tall, tree-like humanoid figures. I've seen some without faces, but wearing brilliant renaissance gowns. My own spirit guide resembles a human woman, so some of them can look incredibly normal. It's up to chance with them. Okay, here we are, with the more sinister side of things. The reason I'm writing this all in the first place. The reason why I have the thought to type this damn thing up and give all my information away to Reddit. Demons. I like to separate them into two categories, lower level and higher level. Let's break down both of them, just to make sure that everyone can understand the signs and be aware of the paranormal. Lower level demons are chasing after fear. They relish it, feed off of it, will do anything they can to obtain it. They like to prey on small children, especially because they are prone to being frightened and uncontrollable. They will deliberately show themselves to people, trying anything to seep into your fear and become stronger. They can manipulate themselves into just about anything, although most of the time they don't even need to do so. These demons give off an energy of dread, even if they just present themselves as a silhouetted shadow or a man in a hat. I have experienced one of these demons myself, but only once, and only when I was young. I had been walking through a hallway in my childhood home, towards my mother's room. I couldn't tell you why I was heading there in the first place because every reason or thought I had going through my head at the time was cut abruptly short as I looked to my right into one of the guest rooms. There it stood, a dark figure without detail. I froze in fear not knowing what to do. At the time I had to have only been five or six, so naturally I started crying. There I remained though, paralyzed in this demon's gaze. I wouldn't be able to do it justice, but it gave off a low, deep noise that made me want to retreat back into my own skin. A noise that fed it fear while, at the same time, making me fearful. It stood there for what seemed to be an hour and I stood with it, refusing to move in hopes that it would disappear, but too afraid to move myself. My only saving grace was my mother, who stepped out of her room at the end of the hallway, saw me and quickly walked over. She asked what was wrong, only to look over into the room I was staring into. All I heard her say under her breath was, shit, as she grabbed my arm and led me into her room, closing the door once I was inside. A few minutes later, she walked back in and held me for a while, calming me down, and told me what I saw would never be seen again in her household. Now that I have lower level demons out of the way, I need to move on to higher level ones the ones I fear talking about. These demons are not, I repeat, are not to be trifled with. They have and will ruin your goddamn life. I try to not even think of them in the fear that I might lure one to me. I will start off by telling you the signs of their presence and what to look for if you have an inkling that one is nearby or latched to you. One of the first signs is the lack of sleep you'll experience. If you happen to get any sleep at all, it will be riddled with night terrors, 
fears that awaken inside of you that you never even knew you were afraid of to begin with. The higher level demon will, at times, present itself to you in said nightmares, albeit it might not be what you expect. In most instances, they are a passerby that you tend to look over or not notice. This is how they observe you, wrapped in your own terror. They watch, waiting to see if you'll fight, cry, laugh, shake, or even succumb to the nightmare. Any sort of reaction is what it's looking for, even if it's something outrageous or hopeful. Another distinct sign of a higher level demon is the stench. My god, the fucking stench. They reek of year old corpses, rotten meat, bile, shit. It will follow you, and others will smell it on you. Part of the reason for this is to ward off people, keeping them away from you. The other half of the reasoning is to drive you to the brink of insanity. It will never wash off, never die down, and you will never become used to the smell. It is meant to eat away at your senses, make you more fragile. Once this type of demon is getting an understanding for the way you work, it will start to manifest itself to you. At first this may seem trivial, the occasional figure out of your periphery, the random stranger staring at you in a crowd of people. If you notice signs of this, you need to steal your mind and guard yourself in any way you can, whether this be by calling for an angel, fairies, or a priest. It's up to you. You must be proactive about this, though. Once this stage of the latching takes place, you will not have much time to prepare for the worst to come. When I say the worst to come, I mean possession. Possession is, in every way possible, the end result a higher level demon is searching for. Possession is, by the definition of demons, the capturing and taking of one's soul to the depths of hell. Now you may ask, how would you know this? How do you know what the end game of demons is? Well, that's a great question, and one that I'm reluctant to answer, simply because I despise to think of this occasion in the first place. But I don't want people getting hurt, so I'll go into it, just this once. I had reference to my mother earlier in the century. She, as you probably could have assumed, had my gift. As a matter of fact, she helped people with her gift. She tried to, at least. She told me on this particularly lovely day in December, one where the snow was falling lightly onto the sidewalks outside and leaving soft white carpets to walk on. I was 14 at the time, about to turn 15. She had taken me out to coffee that day, and while we sat on the chairs sipping our drinks, she told me her secrets in regards to the paranormal. I was shocked, not knowing anyone else could see the things I did. I would like it if you came with me tonight to a friend's house. She is someone who needs my help, and I think it would be best for you to see this type of thing for yourself. At that moment, I was thrilled. I jumped at the thought of seeing what my mother was going to do and how I could learn from her. She smiled at my enthusiasm, but there was a sadness in her eyes. I know now that that sadness was in regards to my innocence. She wanted to preserve what hope I had for life, but she knew she had to show me something I would inevitably come across during my lifetime. The night descended upon us quickly and my mother drove me to a house that I didn't recognize. It seemed abandoned, the windows boarded with wood. I got out of the car and followed my mother, who I now noticed to be holding an herb in one hand, a Bible in the other. My eyes widened, knowing full well what a Bible implied in regards to the paranormal. Upon entering the decrepit house, I was hit with a wall of hot, smoldering air that made me gag in response. My mother touched my shoulder then, telling me to hold my nose if the stench became too much for me to handle. I walked forward with her and turned right in the living room, where I then saw a woman sitting patiently in a chair. Behind her stood a monstrosity, a being with cracked horns, hooves, fur, and razor-sharp teeth. It must have been eight or nine feet tall, seeing as how it towered over the woman sitting in the chair. My mother stepped forward, Bible and herb in hand. I see you have brought sage, witch. The woman spoke in a deafeningly low pitch. As she spoke, the demon mirrored the words. It spoke through her perfectly. I have, my mother answered, 
bringing a lighter out of her jacket pocket and setting the sage ablaze. The demon breathed out steam behind the woman, who I could see now becoming burned by the heat of the exhalation. My mother wafted the smoke of the sage towards the beast. I see you have brought your daughter, the demon said menacingly. It took a step around the woman, its eyes tearing their way into my soul. I felt my breathing coming out in ragged spasms as my mother looked over to me, her Bible now out and open. You may leave now. Leave the rest to me. I didn't want to leave her. I shouldn't have fucking left her but I knew she had a purpose to fulfill in her life. I had stolen a glance to her spirit guide then. He was a man in a trench coat without a face. He nodded in my direction, and in that moment, I knew I would not see my mother again. I did as she told me, and I left the house. I called my father immediately and he showed up ten minutes later, asking me why I had been out so far and where my mother was. I said nothing, but a hint of concern washed over his face. She's in there, isn't she? He asked, his face turning cold as ice to match the weather outside. I nodded as a tear rolled down my cheek. He grabbed me for a hug and led me to his car. We drove home that night not saying another word until we got home. We walked inside and all he said was, Your mother is the bravest woman I know. She'll come back to us. She never did. Now you all know why I didn't want to talk about this in the first place. Why I didn't want to bring this to light. What I saw that day was horrifying. What I saw was something that people deal with every single day across the globe. What I saw was something that would take my mother from me in the hopes of stomping out all light she had within her. So take my past into consideration the next time you consider summoning something of this level. Consider what happened to my mother and the woman she was trying to protect the next time you smell a particularly foul stench. Please, just think about the signs I've told you in regards to malevolent energy. Even more so, make sure you keep an eye or sense out for the small good energies. Your spirit guide, an angel some ferocious loyal protectors. I hope what I've shared today will help someone. That was the point of all of this, to help people and keep them safe. That's what my mother would have wanted. So please, be kind to your land, and be thankful that angels are more common than you might think. You never know when you'll come across someone with something much more sinister latched to them. Big Maneater killed all of the people of a certain town. Rabbit came and saw what had been done and went back to the next village. Then he told the people about it and instructed them all to run away from that place. After they had gone, Rabbit reddened his lips with some old paint, killed an orphan child who had remained in the village, and walked along, carrying its body over his shoulder, until he met Big Maneater. How are these people down here? said Big Maneater. I have killed them all, said Rabbit. How are the people down there? I have done the same thing to them, said Big Man Eater. This orphan child is all I have left, said Rabbit, giving it to him. Big Man Eater took the child and threw it up into the air, and when it came down, he swallowed it at a gulp. Then he said to Rabbit, Let us become friends, and Rabbit agreed. After they had gone along for a while, they said to each other, Let us shut our eyes and defecate. They did so and Big Man-Eater passed split human bones, while Rabbit passed only grass. Before they opened their eyes, however, Rabbit changed the places of the two piles of excrement, so that the bones were under himself and the grass under Big Man-Eater. When they opened their eyes and Big Man-Eater saw this, he was ashamed. After that, Rabbit said, Let us go to ashes thrown upon camp. When they got there, Rabbit attained a lot of bark and made a fire with it, by and by, Big Man Eater went to sleep, and Rabbit collected a great quantity of ashes and threw it over his chest. He threw a little ash over himself and lay down quickly. Then, Big Man Eater began to groan and stood up. Rabbit also rubbed the ashes off of himself. It's always that way here, said he, and they laid down again for the rest of the night. Next day, Rabbit said, 
Let us go to Tree Falling Camp. They went on, reached this place, and made a fire at the foot of a dead tree. Afterward, Rabbit walked off, found a small tree, and brought it back to camp. When it was nearly midnight, Rabbit pushed the big dead tree down upon Big Maneater, and at the same time laid the small tree over himself. Big Maneater groaned in his sleep, woke up in a fright, and kicked the tree away. Rabbit also threw the tree off of himself, saying, It is always that way here. When day came, Rabbit said to his companion, Let us go down to the stream and jump back and forth across it. When they got there, Rabbit jumped first, and he jumped back and forth four times. Now you jump, he said to Big Maneater. So Big Maneater jumped back and forth four times also. Let us both jump again, said Rabbit, and he went back and forth quickly as before. When he got back the last time, he said to Big Maneater, I will hold your bag while you jump. So Big Maneater gave Rabbit his bag and jumped over. When he started back, however, the river was suddenly filled with water into which he fell, and the current carried him down to the ocean and way beyond it to the other side. Then Rabbit started off, saying over and over, My friend threw his bag down to me on the water. Look, my friend has gone to the ocean. I am calling to him where he has gone, far off on the ocean. I met my fiancé, I'll call him Nick, almost ten years ago. Along the way, some of his friends have become mine, all except for one I'll name Susan. He's known her since she was a teen and thinks of her as a sister. She knows this, and she herself is married with a kid. One night we went out and she put something in my drink, and we stayed at her house. She asked Nick to take her upstairs and he refused. Instead, he looked after me since he only thought I was sick. I woke up the next day and felt like crap, and she was nowhere to be found. Nick and I left and on the way home, I asked him to drop me off at work, since I work at a hospital. I went back to work a few days later, and drugs were found in my system. I about fainted. Nick suggested maybe someone at the bar we went to did it, but I knew. We didn't see her again for another five years. This time she was pregnant and all over Nick. I asked her to stop, but he thought I was overreacting. I started to become suspicious of Susan and Nick, thinking they were having a relationship. He told me they didn't and never have, but I'm still not sure. So flash forward to two years ago, Nick and I got engaged and Susan had moved away. Or I thought she moved away. I started receiving random Facebook messages from my mom's account, who has been deceased for two years. The passwords were changed. The messages stated that my mom never loved me, I was a mistake, and I should just end my life. I was upset and crushed. I didn't understand what was happening. Then Susan, as my mom, started commenting on other people's pictures. They were nasty comments. I started being unfriended from my real life friends. My friends weren't talking to me and ignored my calls and texts. I have been through three phones in the last year due to Susan. Why? Because she sends me nasty text messages all times of the day. I have changed my email, my number, all of it, and nothing. These text messages are scary. They talk about hurting me, how they plan on hurting me, and what Nick is wearing. He insists that he's not seeing her. I made him change his number and phone and delete her from Facebook. I even made him take out his SIM card and turn off Bluetooth just in case. It hasn't stopped. I hired a private investigator, and Susan is using a throwaway phone and one of those apps that change your number. He's told me to be careful since there are a lot of people disappearing in my area, and the police are not too concerned. I came across a website for revenge recently, and everything that was suggested she has done. 
She has signed me up for things I have no interest in, along with ruining any chances of a better job since my email is always hacked. How do I know it's Susan? She married someone that looks just like Nick. It will never end. One edit and then I'm done. Susan and Nick's sister were arrested late last night. I came home after dealing with another issue with his family, and my neighbor was outside. They were all so nosy that it saved me. My neighbor is a retired cop that I have reported Susan to tons of times, 73 times if you must know. He came over to help me take out my trash, but he thought I was home already. Another car was in my garage that was not mine. He called the police while I waited outside. Nick's sister and Susan had trashed my house, but worse, had hurt my dogs. They will make it, thankfully. I can't post much more, but it's all over. Thank goodness. Sorry to bother. Philip K. Michaels was a farmer and lived alone on his farm. He spent all days tending to the fields, his pigs, and his cattle. He often butchered his own meat on the side and would sell it exclusively to some store that only offered the freshest of ingredients. Of course, he saved the best cuts for himself. Every Saturday night, he made himself a nice roast beef sandwich, some au jus, and a side of fries and relaxed, watching the news before heading into the city. Now Philip was still pretty young, just early thirties, but he was awkward and lonely. This made it hard for him to go out and connect with women, and would often use the money he got to buy a hotel room and an evening of love from a stranger. Unlike Robert Picton, who would then kill and feed the strangers to his pigs, Philip would simply go home in the morning. The problem with Philip was his taste in strangers. The nearby city was expanding and becoming a hub of all kinds of dark things, including sex trafficking. Philip just so happened to like them young. And the younger, the better. The police wouldn't find Philip, but they'd find signs of a struggle and a half-eaten roast beef sandwich in his home several days too late. They said my great-granddaddy Joe was a medical marvel. They said he was a survivor, a fighter with a lust for life. Of course, that wasn't entirely true. The truth was, he made a deal with death. When I was a kid, it was his favorite story. He'd pull me close to him and say, Did I ever tell you about the time I cheated death, Thomas? And even though I'd heard the story many times, I'd shake my head vigorously and ask him to tell me. I was barely out of short trousers when I signed up for the army, he'd begin, but then there was nothing out of the ordinary about that. So many young men died in the first great war, boys in my regiment barely 15, you know, because they'd lie about their age to sign up, thought they were going to be in for glory. The truth was very different. Anyway, we were at the Ein River, and lord were things grim. Amid the fighting, I noticed this young fella. Looked no more than about 16 or 17 himself. But the reason he stood out to me was he wasn't scared. And let me tell you, we were all scared half-witless out there. But this young fella was almost sauntering about. And I'll tell you something else I noticed. He would touch someone. And the moment he did, they'd die. Some of them were already hit and were on their way out anyway. But some were standing, fighting, and you could guarantee the moment he laid a hand on them, they'd drop like a stone. The funny thing was, even though I was already half out my wits with fear because there were grenades dropping like apples off a tree into the trenches, this young fella scared me more. He was dressed like one of our own, 
and seemed to disappear and reappear in the smoke like a phantom. So anyway, in the blink of an eye, there he was next to me. Thomas, I have never been more scared in my life, but I was a cocky youngin back then and in all honesty I thought I had nothing to lose. Before you lay a hand on me, I said, I have always heard you like a bit of a gamble. Is that true? He looked at me with the blackest eyes you ever did see, and slowly nodded. Well, I don't exactly have a chessboard in my pocket, I said, but I do have my lucky coin. So how about a coin toss? Best of three. Heads I win, tails, you take me. How does that sound? Well, it's rather against the rules, you know, he answered with no word of a lie in his voice. It was the most beautiful sound I've ever heard in my goddamn life. I nearly changed my mind just at the sound of it, but then I thought about your great-grandma back home. She was just a slip of a thing back then, but I was mad for her, and I would have given anything to get back home and see her. He looked at the carnage around him, and I could see the sadness on his face. Lucky for you, I'm in the mood to break the odd rule today. Heads, you win. Tails, you lose. And his face broke into the most angelic of smiles. Now I can't tell you how relieved I was, because what death didn't know, and I was praying he couldn't read minds, was that my lucky coin was a two-headed sixpence. Sometimes when coins were minted back in those days, there'd be a mistake. And though they were rare, you'd get the occasional two-headed or two-tailed coin. So anyway, I tossed my coin and it came up heads. Tossed it again, and it came up heads again. Then death gave me the strangest look. For a moment I thought he was wise to my deceit, but after a moment he smiled and said, You win. I'll pass you by. And then he was gone. I saw him many times in the next few weeks, but he never acknowledged me, and I wasn't exactly keen to make his acquaintance again myself. The scent of death was heavy in the air during those weeks, but he never laid a hand on me. What does death smell like? I asked. <laughs> Baby's breath and cat piss, he'd answer with a roar of laughter. This part of the story changed every time and would always be something that made me laugh. The smell of death had ranged from cherries and dead skunks to mint and horse shit and all things in between. Looking back, I suspect the smell of death during the war wasn't something my grandpa Joe cared to remember. In 1961, when he was in his early 60s, Grandpa Joe had a horrendous car accident. A lorry sideswiped him off the road and his car overturned several times, finally ending up in a ditch. He lost a leg and an eye that day. The doctors were amazed that he survived at all. It was a medical miracle. He confided in me that he was sure that the young man driving the ambulance that day was the same young man he'd seen so many years before in the trenches. I swear, Thomas, that accident was meant to kill me. And yet here I am, large as life. I guess the deal I made that day wasn't just a one-time only job. Death was in the ambulance that day, but he never laid a finger on me. If I'm completely honest, I'd never really believed his story. I thought it was just something he made up to amuse me as a child. But I was a little older when he told me about the second incident, and I could tell it made him unsettled, although at the time I'd never realized why. 1983 and Grandpa Joe was diagnosed with cancer. I was 13 at the time and my folks did their best to protect me from the details. All I knew was it was bad. I thought about the stories he'd told me when he was younger and prayed that they were true and that again death would pass him by. He did. After a long and uphill battle, Grandpa Joe went into remission. He was different after that, though. He had a haunted look. I never asked him directly about his illness or recovery, but I could tell it played on his mind, and I knew why. 
Once when he was having a particularly bad day, he asked me, what if he never comes for me? I had no idea what to say. He was now in his mid-80s and his health was dreadful. He was a wreck of a man, half dead, almost blind and unable to walk. As a family, we did what we could to keep him cheerful, but I always felt his smiles were forced, and underneath it all he was afraid. By 1996, he was in his late 90s and his cancer had returned. He was in hospital, wired up to machines that beeped and pumped stuff into him. We had been told there was nothing more that they could do for him, and it was only a matter of time. For his sake, I hoped that was true. While he'd become forgetful in his later years, his mind was still pretty sharp. One day when I was visiting, he was visibly distressed. At first I thought maybe he needed more pain medication, but after he assured me that that wasn't the case, I finally wheeled it out of him. He wanted me to go get his coin. He'd hung on to it for all these years. His lucky coin that had kept death from his door for nearly a century. Maybe I can show him. Maybe if he knows I cheated, he'll take me, he rasped. So I went home and looked. He'd been living with me and my folks for almost 10 years at that point, and I just about tore his room apart looking for the shoebox he said he kept it in. Eventually, my mom came in and asked me what the hell I was doing, and when I told her, she admitted she had thrown it out. Your great-granddaddy is such a hoarder, she sighed, and I just thought it was junk anyway, she added. You surely don't still believe those stories he told you when you were a kid. I wasn't sure if I did or not, but I knew Grandpa Joe did. When I returned empty-handed to the hospital, he was sleeping, the machinery around him humming softly. I was relieved. I didn't know how to tell him my mission had been unsuccessful. As I slumped in the chair next to him, I began to doze off. I was aware of a young doctor quietly entering the room, and as he passed me, he said in a voice like velvet, You should sleep. You need it. And though I tried to rouse myself, I couldn't. It was like being drugged, but it felt so pleasant. I felt warm and peaceful for the first time in days. And even though I slept, I could clearly hear voices in the room. You know I cheated that day, I heard my Grandpa Joe say quietly. There was a low chuckle and a soothing voice answered. Now, Joe, you can stop worrying. Of course I knew. But it didn't matter. I can't break the rules just as I never made them. It wasn't your time that day, that's all. And I thought playing along might give you some comfort in such a macabre situation. You were little more than a child. And the car crash? The cancer? Grandpa Joe's voice sounded weaker. Just not your time again, Joe. And the sound of his voice made my heart happy. I could smell my mother's kitchen on Christmas Day, intermingled with the smell of my dog curling up on my feet during the night. I'm a deeply misunderstood figure, you know, he said in a rueful tone, but I could hear the humor in his voice. I don't murder people. There is enough hate and disease in this world without my help. All I do is stop the suffering. Can you imagine what it would be like if I didn't? I could smell my girlfriend fresh out of the shower, and the smell of the beach on a hot summer's day, and I heard my grandpa's voice very low now. Oh yes, that's what I've been afraid of. So are you ready? Yes. I awoke with a start when my Grandpa Joe flatlined. There was a rush of medical staff into the room, but no attempt was made to resuscitate him, as had been his wish. His face was calm and peaceful. So Grandpa Joe was wrong. When he comes for you, 
death doesn't smell like decay and fear, or even baby's breath and cat piss. He smells like comfort. That's all for Volume 2. Be sure to let me know what you thought in the comment section below. Until next time, everyone take care, be safe, and above all, stay scared.